I am absolutely delighted uh, to have yet another event in this commemoration of a hugely important milestone in the life of uh, higher education in the United States, which is the 50th anniversary of uh, Title IX. And in, I just excited that this event is gonna be a conversation with someone who have spent countless hours uh, researching and writing this fascinating story of uh, Title IX, and that is Sherry uh, Boshert, and her book is very aptly entitled 37 Words, Title IX and 50 Years of Fighting Sex Discrimination, and she just pointed out and she earned uh, Yellow Jacket points because of the color scheme of the cover of the book. But um, I'll tell you, I, th I think it makes uh, just sense to start by just reading those 37 words. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now, these are pretty darn transformative 37 words, and yet when they were passed into law, very few people cared or noticed, and those who noticed, actually, they didn't like it. They didn't like it or, you know, even before it was passed, they didn't think it was necessary. Uh, when the legislation was first drafted by Representative Edith Green of Oregon, um, they, the office reached out to the lobbyists for the National Education Association and to see if he wanted to make some comments. Um, but he said, no, there's no sex, discrimina sex discrimination in education. And even if there was, it's not a problem. And so they didn't even comment on the legislation. Once the legislation was in progress, and there's a whole chapter devoted to how this legislation came to be in the form that it's in as a separate law dealing only with education in its own little silo. Uh, but hardly anyone noticed. And there were a few skirmishes in Congress and enough again, to make a whole chapter, but um, the, the eyes of the nation and the eyes of the media were on the Equal Rights Amendment and the Vietnam War and busing to end racial segregation. No one really noticed this little amendment that was part of the much, much larger must pass educational amendments of 1972. There were many more controversial issues in that. Uh, so it did eventually pass as part of that package, and um, President Nixon signed it, but I would bet you $1,000 he had no idea it was in there. Uh, and and um, it was fascinating to me. Actually, I loved that first chapter because it reminded me of a quote uh, from our fellow Atlantan, greatest Atlantan of all time, Martin Luther King Jr., who said that the oppressed the the people in power seldom give up their power voluntarily it is the oppressed who fight to get it and this well not just the first chapter the entire book but the first chapter makes it very clear that if it hadn't been for these incredibly courageous smart organized women there would be no title IX. and it, it was nothing like it was inevitable and I was fascinated by many of the characters, but specifically, of course, uh, Bernie Sandler. T tell us about that, that origin of the story. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I'd like to read those first two paragraphs just to give Perfect. people a sense, because for me, as a journalist and a writer, the challenge was how do I tell 50 years of history in a book short enough that people will read and that I could get published? I mean, I'm not Doris Kearns Goodwin, no one was going to publish a 600 page book by me. Um, how do I condense all that and yet keep people turning the page? So 
I focus on three main characters, I call them people, whose lives intersected with Title IX for almost all of these 50 years. Um, and in the later chapters, I also focus on a few of the more recent young activists in the last decade who pushed the issue of sexual assault to the forefront. But it starts here. Alone at home, her husband at work and the kids at school, Bernice Resnick Sandler screamed. She exulted in her eureka moment. She'd found it, the missing card from a deck stacked against her. Her heart quickened with her scream of discovery. She'd found it buried in a footnote in a dry government document, part of the voluminous reading she'd pursued to find a solution to her problem. Sandler's mother, Ivy Resnick, called this bibliotherapy. If you don't understand something, ask, she'd say. And if you still don't understand, read. Read everything you can find about it. Ivy had been the first in her family of 10 to graduate from high school. An avid reader herself, she instilled in Bernice a love of bibliotherapy. Over the next four decades, Sandler would use her discovery to change the lives of hundreds of millions of Americans. But on this day in 1969, she simply wanted a job. So that, that introduces Bernice Sandler, who was, uh, her nickname was Bunny. And the origins of Title IX was in jobs. The few women who were admitted to graduate programs and got graduate degrees, most of them could not get jobs in academia. And if they did, they were relegated to the lower echelons, not full professor, were paid less than men in exact same positions, et cetera. That was the origins. But Bernice did bibliotherapy, which is appropriate since we're right now in a library. Uh, and that is good advice for anyone, I think, facing yeah. a challenge. I was um, also very intrigued because she does not start being an activist or even describing herself as a feminist. She just fights to get admitted into graduate school. And all of a sudden, she faces, wait a second, why are there so few women? And why are all these guys getting jobs? And we, I mean, even I was shocked, honestly, I, the whole book, I was embarrassed that I didn't know most of this stuff. That guy takes so much for granted. The letters of rejection and how explicit they were when you were rejected out of jobs were just mind blowing. Yeah. Well, well, you and me both, I was embarrassed how little I knew when I first started researching this book. Because someone of my generation knows Title IX mostly as getting girls into court. And it does that, and it did that, and it, there's still struggles there. Um, but there's so much more to Title IX. It covers everything. In, in fact, one little segue here, one of my favorite slogans these days in this time of uh, climate change crisis is that electricians are going to save the world. We need electricians to install the windmills and the solar panels and expand our grid. But today in the United States, only 2% of electricians are women. So if we're only training boys and men to be electricians, we're missing half the workforce that we need to save the world from climate crisis. So Title IX covers everything in education. Um, but Bernice Sandler, she really just first wanted to understand it. Why couldn't she get an interview? There were seven tenure track job openings in her department at the University of Maryland. Why couldn't she? So she read, she read, she had bibliotherapy, and eventually she discovered Executive Order 11246 as amended by Executive Order 11375 in the footnote of a document related to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And so much of Title IX and the movement for sex equity in education comes out of the Civil Rights Movement. It comes out of the women's movement. It comes out of the movement against sexual violence. It comes out of the LGBTQ plus movement. The movements are the real characters in this book and the activism and the demands for better than the status quo. The characters are the people I tell the story through, but I want you to see that there's not just three main characters, there's a cast of millions mm -hmm. and we're all in it. Yeah. Title IX has touched all of our lives. Mean, meanwhile, of course, I was shocked. I mean, there's, I'm still on that uh reading from that first chapter because i find it fascinating and i'm quoting both the washington post and new york times editorialized against it 
And the book quotes, though motivated by the best of intentions, such legislation is unsound because the sexes have different needs and aspirations, the Times argued. Yeah, it, it, it was just astounding to me how blatant, like you said, the discrimination was and the attitudes were. I did a lot of research in um, uh, archival libraries. I mean, first I started in the Library of Congress, of course, because there's legislation. But then I spent a lot of time at the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America at the Radcliffe Institute. Oh, if you ever get to go there, they have everything. And for someone like me, a journalist who is used to uh, dealing with the here and now and events that are just happening, and like, we may not know the history of it because it's just happening, to be able to sit in the library and hold a letter written by the legal genius Polly Murray to Bernie Sandler or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they had a correspondence. It was thrilling, um, but also to see these letters from women who were desperate, who applied for academic jobs and were blatantly told in a letter, sorry, we don't consider women. And the job advertising back then, uh, it was legal to say, assistant professor of psychology, men preferred or man wanted. And that was all perfectly legal. And, and that's what motivated Bernice Sandler. She knew in her heart this was morally wrong and this was unjust, but could it be legal? And that led to her research and led to her essentially starting to file with the help of a, a very proper activist group called uh, the Women's Equity Action League, who formed basically because they thought now was too radical. The National Organization for Women, they weren't ladies. So Wheel was ladies and uh, mostly from the Midwest and Sandler felt comfortable with them. So with their help in communicating with other women around the country and the help of a wonderful man in the labor department uh, who basically took her on and tutored her, she filed hundreds of complaints against colleges around the country because according to those executive orders, you could not discriminate on the basis of sex if you received federal money and almost every school does. So she took it from there. Edith Green picked up the ball, turned it into legislation. Other uh, women's and civil rights groups joined in and we ended up with Title IX. Then I, I also uh, was very, was fascinated about how long it took um, the executive branch to then write all the regulations. And, um, and when it was clear that these upcoming regulations would include provisions for um, equal opportunities in athletics, I was also surprised. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read to you um, to guess who, who else was against this. Athletic directors in the NCAA I'm sure you had fun reading, writing this paragraph. Athletic directors and the NCAA could have embraced the societal movement towards equity and made sincere efforts such as splitting budgets or scholarships money equally between men's and women's programs or fairly balancing game scheduling supplies and recruiting efforts or providing equally qualified coaches. They did the opposite. To protect men's turf, they attacked Title IX. Yeah, and that's how Title IX came to be known as, you know, the law about sports. It started because of employment and access to graduate programs. But almost as soon as it passed, athletic directors and coaches, men's coaches, especially football, um, realized, what? We have to share resources? No, 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 no. Girls don't even want to play sports. And they spent the next decade and more, but especially the next decade, fighting and they had allies in Congress. And so women's advocates spent the whole 1970s playing whack-a-mole, just trying to defeat one bill after another that would either weaken Title IX or get rid of it entirely or at least exempt football. And as you said, the regulations were a, a big part of that. You know, when you have a civil rights law, there's three parts. You pass the law, says you shall not discriminate. Then you have to write the implementing regulations. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean? How, how do I know if I'm not discriminating? And the regulations say, well, if you do this and this and this, then you're in compliance. If you don't do this and this, then you're violating the law. And once you have those regulations, then you have to enforce them. 
So you have the law, the regulations, and enforcement. And e any of those can be attacked or ignored or weakened or upheld. Uh, and so the, the regulations for Title IX, there were huge battles around that. They finally were passed in 1975. So that took three years. With most other civil rights laws, it took about six months. It took about three years to craft the regulations. And then there were deadlines by which schools were supposed to comply by 1977 or 78. And they took that deadline to mean, oh, we don't have to do anything till then. So by the time the deadlines came, they weren't in compliance. And they said, just, we don't know what you're talking about, especially in athletics. You know, explain it to us. So they did an addendum. They did a, a, an extra, more detailed set of regulations in 1979 on how to comply in athletics. And I have to say, you know, that whole battle is really instructive for today because it was not a given that we were going to have men's and women's sports. That was just one option, okay? It could have been, and these are options that might be considered with the whole issue of transgender athletes in sports today. I mean, if you have just men and women, what do you do with intersex students? What do you do with non-binary students? What do you do with transgender students? I mean, if we as a society feel that athletics is an important part of education, it should be accessible to every student. So how do we do that? Well, in the 1970s, when they were trying to decide, well, how do we include any women? Uh, could be men and women. And then you get into details, well, do you split the money equally or what? But we're not gonna get there. Or you could say, um, well, what if we organize sports based on height or weight or other factors? Today, the people toss around testosterone levels as a potential factor. Um, or what if we have men's and women's sports, but we do it along the Olympic model where, you know, Georgia Tech competes against this other school, men's and women's, and then you add up the scores and whichever school has the higher score wins. And so that's an incentive to invest equally in your men's and women's sports because they both add to that score equally. So, you know, you need to think outside the box a little bit and the history can help instruct us. And feminists were split on all of this back then. And the ACLU and now, because they came out of the civil rights movement said separate can never be equal. And they oppose the concept of men's and women's sports. And so how do you then have it together and equally? But the other women were saying, the other women's advocates were saying, look, you know, time's running out. If we don't pick something right now, we're not gonna have women's sports for another decade. So the ACLU agreed to step aside. Uh, now never did, now fought to the end, but we ended up with men's and women's sports. Um, and a, instead of the Office for Civil Rights, instead of splitting the money equally, saying each school has to give equal money to men's and women's sports, which they almost did, instead we ended up with a three-pronged test or a three-part test, which some of you may be familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these were not simple questions. The issue of transgender athletes today is not a simple question. The one thing they wanted that we that they didn't get that we might consider today is an off ramp. Okay, we'll say men's and women's sports, but let's revisit this in 10 years because maybe that's not the best way to do it. They didn't get the off ramp. So 50 years later, we have what they decided on the 1970s. I was also uh, very intrigued. I didn't know this, that there was a competing organization to the NCAA, and that was the Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women. Yes. And uh, and finally, I think, I guess, when this NCAA saw that there was no way around this, that there would be a equality of opportunity for women in sports, they finally took over, and, and the Women's Association pretty much vanished. Yeah, yeah, they, you know, the NCAA sued the Office for Civil Rights trying to get rid of Title IX or at least exempt sports. By the early 80s, uh, it was clear Title IX was not going to go away. It was very popular, and it just got more popular with every decade. Um, and when it became clear that money was going to flow into women's athletics and that Title IX was not going away, the NCAA said, okay, we need to move into this space. Uh, and they had a lot more resources and a lot more organization than the AIAW, and the AIAW basically folded. One of the other ways... Um, the NCAA's decision to move into this had an impact was, you know, before Title IX, about 90% of women's athletic teams were coached by women. 
10 years later and to today, it's 40 some percent uh, because men moved into those jobs too. Um, and that might have made some sense back then because boys and men had a lot more training in athletics, they had a lot more experience. Doesn't necessarily make sense today. Today, I think it's an area of potential discrimination to look at. Yeah. Well, we happen to have a, a women's basketball team that uh, where the entire coaching staff is women. And uh, <clears throat> I, I, I wasn't sure how unusual that was until I, I asked the coach uh, and, and she said, you know, it's exactly what you said, that the numbers actually decline of, uh, of women head, co head coaches, but it is, we may be the only program where the entire coaching staff is women. And, um, and, and to see the sort of the relevance of Title IX in, in uh, 2022, I think it was this year, I don't know if it was this year or last year, uh, there was um, an embarrassing moment during the March Madness uh, yeah. tournament when um, one of the student athletes took a photo of the uh, very fancy gym that had been set up for women, which I think included uh, uh, six pairs of dumbbells. This is for all the teams competing. And, and she posted it online uh, compared to the slightly fancier gem that was available uh, for that man. And, and um, our coach uh, posted that online and, and did the equivalent of a slime on the table on, uh, on Twitter. And within 24 hours, a, uh, a gem magically appeared, by the way. Uh, so, uh -huh. so, but, but um, <clears throat> I, I, so you said that, of course, Title IX is but much more than sports. But interestingly, this is an area where sports led the way because I guess people understood the issues around sports as sports was making progress in a way. Is it fair to say that they were making things better throughout every other aspect of higher education? You know, I think sports did lead the way. Um, having Title IX really helped with the jobs and hiring and pay. So did Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and the uh, equal um, uh, men, part of the uh, constitutions, you know, in terms of jobs. Um, but, you know, like I said, the, the movements are the real stars of this book. Women had been pushing and girls pu pushing to get into sports even before Title IX. Uh, there was a huge jump in the number of high school athletes between 1972 when Title IX passed in 1973, and you can't really credit Title IX for that. Girls and, and others were pushing. In fact, a lot of the early lawsuits, even pre-Title IX, came from fathers of athletically talented girls because they wanted them to have the same opportunities as their sons. So that's one reason by the end of the 70s and early 80s, it became clear that this wasn't going away in athletics because you know, the numbers just increased. I mean, by 1979, women were a majority of undergraduates. It was that quick because that movement was already happening. Title IX became a tool and helped it. And that wasn't necessarily the case in some of the, it, the progress wasn't as clear. I mean, the movement against sexual violence, um, Title IX, the first lawsuit was in 1977. It's been a slower progress for that because the culture hasn't changed as quickly. Our culture was ready to change some in athletics, um, but it's still, it's still an issue. I mean, I looked at the local colleges online last night. There's a federal law passed by two black women members of Congress in the 1990s called the Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act, EADA. And every university and college is required every year to report how many men and women are playing on your team. How many coaches are men and women? What do you pay them? What kind of money do you pour into each program? Please tell me we're compliant. You know, I, I will say in some ways you're doing better than, than other places. Uh, this, this is data from 2020 to 2021. That's the most recent data. And uh, the biggest challenge here, I think, is, you know, women are 40% of undergraduates at least were at that time. And I know you're working very hard and have really great programs to increase that percentage. Um, and so that's what you have to compare to. So your total playing slots in athletics very much mirror the number of women in your undergraduates. So in that sense, you're doing better than most every college I look up because the idea is 
If women are 40% of undergraduates, they should be 40% of your athletes. And you're very close to that. Where you are similar to other places and not doing so great is head coaches, far more men than women. And whether they're men and women, the coaches who are coaching the women's teams, on average, are paid only 28% of what you pay coaches of men's teams. Now, I didn't drill down into this. I'm suspecting that, like many places, your football and basketball men's coach get paid a lot of money and everyone else a lot less. But on average, to say that women's teams coaches are paid 20% of men's doesn't look good. Total expenses for men's and women's, the women get 31% of what are spent on men. So you can look at that different ways. I know football is very important. It's part of the higher education culture. Um, but in terms of equity, you know, if we go back to the 1970s, when football was saying, just exempt us, we're different, that attitude still lingers, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, well, I guess only, um, and we have our senior woman administrator in the front row, so she can correct me, but I mean, <clears throat> at least just on one of those numbers would be um, female coaches. We do very well, right? Because we have, women's basketball, we have softball, we have volleyball, we have swimming and diving. And that's actually the head coach for the entire, for all men's and women's uh, swimming and diving. So I guess on that variable, we do okay, but I don't know. Yeah, about, like I said, yeah. I mean, I was impressed despite it might sound negative for me, you're doing better than a lot of places. I look at a lot of places that are so egregiously not in compliance with Title IX. I have to think, how does this go on? And it's because if no one complains, if no one speaks up, then it just goes on. But there are repercussions to speaking up. That's one of the other three people that I focus on in the book to tell the story of athletics uh, is Diane Milutinovich, who was an athletic administrator at Fresno State University. And I especially liked having her in the book because a lot of Title IX history is told through the elite East Coast universities or the Washington DC halls of power. Fresno State University in California is a rural, um, much more socioeconomically diverse, much more ethnically diverse uh, state university. And so I was able to describe how Title IX played out there. Uh, but Diane Milutinovich, when I sat down to interview her, one of the things she pointed out was you know, if you, as an athletic administrator or coach, if you file a complaint, or for goodness sakes, if you sue, whether you win or not, and they almost always win because they don't speak up unless it's egregious. But if you do that, you'll never be hired again anywhere else. She wasn't. The other two coaches at Fresno State, who won some of the largest civil rights judgments from juries in history, none of them have been hired again. And they're all younger women except for Diane. She was in her 50s. You know, she was about ready to retire. But those younger coaches, so if someone sues, you know they're risking their career. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. So it goes on partly because people are afraid to speak up. And that's where groups like the National Women's Law Center or Equal Rights Advocates or groups that can speak up for them are important, I think. So moving... Um away from sports for a second and then and uh, get into the um, also hugely important area of, um, of sexual harassment and sexual violence. Um, it was not until 81 when OCR makes clear that Title IX does cover sexual harassment and sexual violence. And, um, and of course, that has been another huge issue in Howard education, also with, with, with its ups and downs, right? And I wonder if you can also discuss maybe the last decade of, uh, of Title IX and sexual violence and the sort of going from the, the Obama administration to the Trump administration to now the Biden administration. Sure, and if, if you'll allow me, I'll give just a couple of words of history before that. Please, so please do, please, absolutely. The last decade better. Um, you know, Title IX, like I said originally, uh, 
when it was being fashioned. It was supposed to just amend Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination in broad swaths of society, not just education, prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. And they were simply going to add the word sex. But that didn't happen. There was pushback from the Nixon administration and Frankie Freeman, who was the only black person and the only woman at the time on the US Commission for Civil Rights, was afraid that by adding sex, we would dilute attention to ending racism in America. And this was only six years after we'd passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and we were not doing a good job. And so in the end, Edith Green took their advice and made Title IX its own standalone law, only in education. And that set a pattern for subsequent civil rights laws. Section 504, which prohibits discrimination on disability, which came out the next year. The Age Discrimination Act, 1975. All of them ended up as separate laws in their own silos using the same first 37 words as Title VI. And you know, they did that because they were afraid that grouping them all together would weaken them. And in the end, the opposite happened. Having them in separate silos made them weaker. And that shows up specifically in um, the issue of sexual harassment and assault. Like I said, the first lawsuit was in 1977 when no one even knew if Title IX applied to sexual harassment. They only, society only started to use the phrase sexual harassment as the term to use around 1976. So this whole thing was new. And in 77, students at Yale sued. It was uh, four or five white young um, women students, one black woman student, and one gay male professor sued because all they wanted was to have some grievance policy, some way to say, hey, someone assaulted me or I'm being sexually harassed. And Yale, no colleges had that at the time, okay? The first judge who took a pass at it said, yeah, I think Title IX should apply to this. I mean, that's discrimination if you're sexually harassed and can't stay in school. But all the plaintiffs got tossed out of that lawsuit except one, Pamela Price, a black student. And the next judge reduced it to a case of the word of one young black woman against a white male professor. Well, you can imagine she lost that case. They lost the appeal. The only thing they won was the recognition that Title IX applies to sexual harassment and assault. And over the years, the Office for Civil Rights provided guidance especially starting around 1996. They started to come out with more specific guidance because just like with athletics, people said, we don't know what you're talking about. Spell it out for us. And in 2011, one of those guidances that came from the Obama administration gave them more specifics. They Each one got more and more specific, but they were specific enough in 2011 and the movement against sexual violence had progressed enough by then because it, believe me, it was happening on campuses just like the rest of society. I mean, Anita Hill um, gave it a big boost in the early 90s. So by 2011, students, when they read this new guidance from the Office for Civil Rights, they went, holy cow, we get it. This now we know what to do. We can file a complaint. And by then we had social media. And by talking to each other, they realized this wasn't just happening at my little college. It's happening all across the country. So you had this coming together through social media and uh, the, that moment in time from the movement against sexual violence where women all over the country started to speak out and say, enough, this is not okay, this is violating Title IX. And you started to see it in headlines around 2012, 2013, 2014. That's what got me into writing this book. It's like, oh, that's interesting. It's not just sports. And I started to look into it more and more. And that led to the hashtag MeToo movement coming out of Hollywood. Um, it led us to this cultural moment, which is still very much in play about how do we deal with sexual harassment and assault. And the reason I started with that very early history of how Title IX was a separate law is because today we have a better understanding of intersectional discrimination. If someone harasses me, is it because I'm a woman or because I'm a lesbian? If someone harasses a woman of color, is it because she's a black woman or because she's a black person or a woman? And often on campuses today, you have separate offices and you have to decide, do I go to the office that handles racial discrimination? Do I go to the office that handles sex discrimination? That's not reality. You can't divide that person. And so 
I'm, I'm wondering if colleges will start to condense those, if we will start to see that coming together where you can see the person as a whole. There is legislation in Congress right now, the Equality Act, that brings us first full circle to what Title IX was trying to do. And it would add an amendment to Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. It would add the words sex and gender and do what Edith Green and the others originally wanted to do was put it all in the same thing. It's not just education. You can't split these things up. We have to just think of us as you know, discrimination, discrimination against one is a discrimination against all. We have to see the bigger picture. Long-winded answer to your question. No, 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 no. It is, it is absolutely, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. And, um, and, and we're still dealing with it because the, to the best we know, the, the underlying phenomenon hasn't changed much. Uh, as studied by sociologists trying to use indirect methods to, under, to, to, to figure out with the prevalence of sexual violence on college campuses, the rate of reporting, fortunately, has gone up. So I think, I think uh, Title IX, that case, has, has made it easier for people to speak up with all the barriers that, 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 you, that and, you mentioned. And, and, you know, I feel for Title IX offices mm -hmm. on campus today because part of the culture wars it has been escalated. You know, they went. The Trump administration went for the nuclear option instead of the Office for Civil Rights just issuing guidances every year, which are not mandatory, but they basically say, "Look, if you do these things, we will consider you in compliance with Title IX. If you don't do these things and we get a complaint, we might have to investigate you." Well, the Trump administration instead instead said, "You know what? We're going to change the regulations themselves." They hadn't been changed since they first came out in the 1970s. So they changed them, and now the Biden administration is going to change them back. And if you're a Title IX administrator here or anywhere, I mean, good luck. I feel for you because yeah. you're trying to serve the students and faculty you're meant to serve, and you're being given mixed signals by government that move slowly back and forth. Yeah. No, I see some heads nodding here by some of my colleagues. I promise I will give you a little bit of a context of uh, women at, at, at Georgia Tech. Okay. So uh, here it goes. Some of you may know this whole story. Some of you may know only pieces of it. I think it was very useful to me. So I'll tell you the whole story. So it turns out it was um, uh, President Blake Van Leer and his wife, Ella Van Leer. Ella was a trained architect. And uh, well, the trio, there were many, many more people, as you mentioned. But if in choosing three characters would be those two and our librarian's uh, predecessor, Dorothy Crossland, next building is named after her. She's a giant in the history of this place. Anyway, uh, the Van Leers, even though uh, he was he served as president, they had a daughter, Marley. Marley uh, wanted to be a chemical engineer, and she could not study chemical engineer at Georgia Tech, where her dad was president. And uh, the Van Leers fought this, and, and, and President Van Leer at the time um, fought this also with, uh, with, the, with the regents, and, and it was no. Uh, Merely uh, eventually had to go to, to Vanderbilt. She was a rock star. She was the first uh, woman to graduate in chem -E. She went on to Florida to get her master's and her PhD. Eventually, she became a college president herself. That's what we missed out on. But the, the, the fight continued. Um, Dorothy Crossland, who, uh, as I understand, was someone that he might not be too wise to uh, confront or to disagree with, she, she took this on. She, by the way, she's also the, the mother of computer science at Georgia Tech. I mean, she was a really uh, an amazing. She wrote uh, a letter to the Board of Regents expressing her views on this matter. Uh, eventually, the board voted seven to five to admit women only in degrees where there were no other options within the university system of Georgia, namely engineering and architecture. If you wanted to study math, go somewhere else. Um, and eventually in, in 1968, it was, it was, that provision was abolished and, and since then, um, we've had, so this year, we not only celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX, 
we celebrate the 70th anniversary of, of women on, on, on campus. Um, and um, we're trying to do we're trying to do better. As, as I mentioned earlier, we have now reached in the undergraduate population, we have surpassed 40 percent, which may not be very impressive. Most universities have more women than men, but for us, it's a high uh, watermark. And, uh, and, and being predominantly a technological university is, uh, is, is a big deal. Um, and then we, we have some interesting parts of our uh, culture and our history that will occasionally flare up, including our fight song. Um, some of my colleagues are, is he going to bring this up now? I mean, uh, so there is a, there's a stanza in the fight song says, if I had a, a, a daughter, uh, I'll, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, 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 uh, I'll dress her in white and gold. I'll dress her in white and gold, put her on the campus to cheer the brave and bold. Uh, so some of our uh, leading female faculty, especially, they don't like uh, so some of some are very upset with the cheering part. It's like, what do you mean a woman can only cheer? Uh, my wife is also a yellow jacket graduate. She's upset with the, what do you mean my daddy's going to dress me in anything? <laughs> uh, the students have resolved this in a very Title IX way. And unofficially, they have moved on from this version. Says, if I had a daughter, I'll tell you, I'll dress her in white and gold and I'll put her on the campus to raise the ratio that's <laughs> so that's that's become sort of the unofficial version which has become dominant among our uh, among our students hey i i promise i would give a chance to some of our uh, colleagues here to ask questions i know you have a, a ton of questions there's a microphone that will that will reach you if you raise your uh, your hand And if not, I'll keep uh, dominating the, the question. Shy and doesn't have questions. I would love to read the last, um, go, the last paragraph. I would love it. Go for it. Okay. And thank you for sharing that history from Georgia Tech because that's part of the cast of millions I referred to. I mean, these stories are everywhere of people who are still pushing forward to equity in education. Chaos theory tells us that the flap of a butterfly's wings can trigger a tornado thousands of miles away. Small actions can have large effects under the right conditions. The movements for sexual and gender equity are like legions of butterflies, Catherine McKinnon said in 2017. Some go splat on the windshield, but still they come. Their strength lies in the, quote, collaborative effects of collective repetition, end quote, a phrase she borrowed from feminist author Kate Millett. Title IX's history is a kaleidoscope of butterflies, a tale of ongoing movements and new beginnings, a chronicle of progress and setbacks, and forging ahead even if you're unaware of the previous progress and setbacks. The ending to this book is simply that there's no end to the story. That's not the end of the book, but it's often a good place to end a conversation. Mm -hmm. We do have one question from online, if, if it's okay to ask this that would be one a perfect, question. Uh, perfect. So this might be the one. Um, the question was in reference to your comment about the retaliation or the consequences that women may face while filing a lawsuit. Thoughts or reactions on what we as a society or we here at Georgia Tech can do to help support or protect those individuals so they don't have those consequences and they can still speak up. Yeah, um, that's a, a little bit of a tough one. I mean, that example in athletics, you know, really was on the repercussion of um, staff. Uh, if they spoke up, women in athletics, uh, the, the students can often speak up with much less repercussions. Um, you can, anyone can file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights and you can do so anonymous if you want to. But there are also lots of organizations out there, out there now it's just that the students often in athletics aren't often as aware of the inequities as the staff are. Um, so that's that's a little complicated. But you know, again, like I said, there's uh, National Women's Law Center, a group called Champion Women, um, often takes on these issues. Uh, a similar thing ap applies with anyone filing a complaint about the management of sexual harassment and assault, and that's often students doing that. And there's a different kind of repercussion 
you know, where they are shamed, ostracized, criticized, regardless of what they have to go through in the whole complaint process, which can often re-traumatize re them depending on the rules and everything and what the current uh, management style is. Um, but a lot of this needs to be culture change and culture change is hard and it takes time. And a lot has changed in 50 years. I can attest to that as someone who had no high school sports to access, who got in, who helped co-educate a, a liberal arts college, but had never heard of Title IX. I didn't know why they were letting me in. I just knew I was getting in. You know, culture change has changed a lot and we have a lot to go. And so my main uh, advice is if you're talking about staff, you want some good legal reputation, representation. If you're talking about students, um, same thing, but we all need to stand up and support people who are willing to speak out. And as someone said earlier here, you know, get comfortable with discomfort because that leads to change. Any additional questions? I'm going to let you have the last word here, but uh, before that, um, any additional questions? This is, by the way, our senior woman administrator. Yeah, She's funny. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, excuse myself. So I, I want to ask you this question. I have, I thought I read and I've heard that if the word activity was not in the 37 words, then maybe athletics wouldn't have been tied into the law. Do well, you know if that's true? I mean, that's possible, but I think that wording comes from Title VI. Uh, it's just that for Title IX's purpose, they added education program or activity. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say a lot of people may not be aware of this. I certainly wasn't. We lost Title IX in the 1980s. You know, Title IX came and went. I mean, it's not like it disappeared, but um, because of all those battles in the 1970s trying to weaken it down or limit it in some ways, one of the theories that they threw up into the courts was, you know, Title IX shouldn't apply to an entire institution, entire college or school. It should only be to the particular department that directly receives federal funding, which athletics doesn't typically. Um, and there was a uh, private Christian college, Grove City College, uh, that only received federal funding in its financial de aid department for students. And they sued and they took it all the way to the Supreme Court. By the time it reached the Supreme Court in the early 80s, um, the Reagan administ administration was in power. They were not friends of Title IX. Uh, they called it the Lesbians Bill of Rights. They did everything they could to defund it and weaken it. Uh, and so they did not defend Title IX before the Supreme Court vigorously. And the Supreme Court said, Hmm, it only applies to specific departments? Okay. So from 1984 to 1988, it eviscerated Title IX. Uh, lots of sports programs, um, you know, uh, lots of Office for Civil Rights investigations of athletic programs were dropped. Uh, that some of the investigations around sexual harassment were dropped because if you were assaulted in the English department building that wasn't built with a federal loan or grant, Title IX didn't apply, but if you were assaulted in, say, the economics building that was built with federal funds, then it would apply. It was insane. It took all of these constituencies, because it didn't just eviscerate Title IX. Remember, it's the same 37 words as Title VI, uh, Section 504, Asian Discrimination Act. All of them just pretty much disappeared in education. Now, because of the movements behind them in athletics, women didn't lose the gains they had made but they didn't make any gains during that time while men's sports programs exploded. Um, but all those constituencies came together and got Congress to pass the Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1988. And then these laws were all back into power. That's why you see a surge in the 1990s around these issues. Uh, so wording is important and legal rulings are important. There's lots of other legal rulings that have affected especially how effective Title IX is around sexual harassment and assault. Um, and Title IX isn't necessarily here to stay. I mean, you've seen the, the attacks on abortion rights this year. We could lose Title IX too. I, every poor mother I interviewed for this book, when I asked them, could we ever lose Title IX? They said, of course, and that blew my mind. So it's worth, you know, we need to carry on all of us and be that butterfly that either goes flat on the windshield or causes a tornado around the world. That's our job.
Well, I was going to ask you to exactly close us with a call for action. You kind of just did. Uh, but is there anything else you want to leave us with? I just want to say thank you for having me here. I'm in, on the last five days of a four-week book tour, and this is the best audience I have had on this trip. Um, it's great to see the interest in Title IX here, and especially to sit down with you um, and uh, share these thoughts. So thank you. And uh, Well, thank you for educating all of us, uh, this is really fascinating, and I and I do uh, recommend the read. It's, uh, if you haven't read this, it's uh, it's worth uh, your time. It's just a fascinating. It's not just a fascinating uh, story again of uh, of women's rights. Uh, it's also it's also a story of leadership and change and how and how change happens. Incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.